Good morning. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. And today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, frontal systems. You know, these are what causes, when these systems move through the area, this is what causes those major temperature changes that we experience, especially in the fall and winter months. You know, we can, we can have a major change in temperatures, you know, on the order of 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, simply by noticing where these fronts are located and if they're moving through our area or not. And I've seen some crazy temperature swings, especially across Southeast Virginia, um, due to these frontal movements. So let's take a look at a little bit of training today on these frontal systems. Um, I have an extensive amount of information to get to. Uh, I'm gonna try to limit it and, and not go too, too long. I may have to make a secondary video to kind of cover up the other, cover the other topics. So let's first talk about what a frontal surface is. And a frontal surface is basically the boundary separating two air masses. You know, you with a, any kind of frontal surface, you have two different air masses um, on both sides of the front. And this boundary separates two air masses along which a distinct contrast in temperature. In addition to temperature changes, we have moisture changes and the wind is going to shift along with the barometric pressure is going to make some changes as frontal systems approach and move through. The surface front itself is defined as the intersection of the frontal surface and the ground. So where that frontal surface meets the ground, that's where the surface front is located. Here's a graphic to kind of just show you what a frontal surface looks like. And this is a thickness chart if you go towards the right on this chart, our thicknesses get higher or increase. And hypsometric equation, this, shut, this basically states that the higher the thicknesses in the atmosphere, the warmer the temperatures, they're directly proportional. The lower the thickness values, the colder the temperatures. And that makes sense because when the atmosphere is very warm, it wants to expand so those thickness values increase as a result. When the atmosphere is cold, it's much more dense and the atmosphere wants to get more compact or those upper level heights are going to decrease with colder air masses. Uh, this image shows you frontal surface location and you notice how it slopes up above the ground and then eventually where it meets the ground, that's where your front surface front is going to be. And there's going to be a transition zone as you go from the surface or ground level aloft and higher in the atmosphere when you get through a frontal surface through a transition zone. The surface front again is that point where that, that frontal surface intersects and meets the ground. That's what I'm showing you here on this slide. And there also, in addition to surface fronts, there are also upper level fronts which can occur in this example, we show an upper front at about 700 millibars. That's about 10,000 feet above the ground in the atmosphere. So fronts are not just confined solely to the surface where we live here on the ground. They can also be seen in form of upper fronts higher in the atmosphere. That upper front, all it is is a frontal surface that's aloft or high up above the ground. Then you have a boundary the, the definition of a boundary, that's a feature which separates two different air masses. And then you get something known as a frontal trough. A trough is simply, you know, whenever you have a trough in, in the atmosphere, you have a cyclonic curvature to the wind field. Um, and that's going to coincide with the frontal surface itself. This is an example of a um, warm front coming out of a area of low pressure. This low pressure is stamped the big L on the left hand portion of the graphic. That solid black line works its way east southeast away from that surface low pressure system. The dark solid lines are showing you isobars or lines of equal barometric pressure and the dashed lines, the dashed black lines are indicative of the thickness values. And generally if you were to look at a 1,000 to 500 millibar thickness chart, which we're looking at here, the frontal system is going to basically be placed right in where you see the bending of these solid dark isobar lines. 
that's where you're going to place your frontal boundary at. So there's a couple of different types of fronts I want to talk about. And, you know, we've seen these on the general weather maps on the evening news. You may have seen the blue line with the blue triangles. That's known as a cold front. You may have seen the warm line, warm solid, a red line with um, semicircles. That's a warm front. And then you get a stationary frontal boundary as well as an occluded frontal boundary. So there's really four types of fronts. I'm going to start by talking about active versus passive cold fronts. So with cold fronts, we have two types, active and passive. And the amount of cloudiness and precipitation associated with cold fronts is going to be highly variable, highly changeable. And it's primarily going to depend on the jet stream as well as the moisture availability. How much moisture is available in the atmosphere as a frontal system comes in? And as well as the stability of the atmosphere. What type of precipitation you get is dependent on the stability of the atmosphere. So for example, if we have an unstable atmosphere, we would expect more of a cold air aloft over a warmer heated surface. If we have a stable atmosphere, we would have warm air aloft over a cooler surface. In general, that's going to determine whether you have, let's say, thunderstorms and really showery precipitation versus more steady, uh, continuous precipitation. All right, so active cold fronts, these are the type of cold front that are associated with extensive regions of cloudiness and precipitation. We have what's known as divergence in the jet stream, and that's the removal of mass, removal of mass high, high up at the jet stream level at about 30,000 feet. This is going to produce extensive lifting of warmer air near a cold front. So we have to look at the placement of, and I did a previous video on jet streams, uh, as well as areas of upper level divergence, the chimney effect, upper level convergence, the damper effect. Generally, if you have mass being removed aloft, divergence at the jet stream level at, at 30,000 feet, you're going to, it's going to promote a vertical rising of air and extensive lifting of warmer air as that cold front moves in. Uh, generally, that rising air motion, that lifting, that rising warmer air, is going to be located downstream uh, of the upper trough axis and it's often associated with vigorous advection lobes of vorticity. I talked another separate video, I, I talked about in another video vorticity, positive and negative vorticity um, in general and how important it is to the dynamics in the middle levels of the atmosphere, and how it supports your surface features, your fronts as well as your areas of lower baroclinic pressure. Right. So warm air advection patterns tend to be well developed in the warm air ahead and or above the frontal surface. Um, generally, you can get lifting of unstable air, which may produce numerous cumulonimbus clouds. That's, those are thunderstorm clouds that produce that lightning that we see in the summertime. Showers and thunderstorms are typically associated with those cumulonimbus clouds. Now, this is lifting um, as a cold front moves into a warmer, unstable air mass. If we have lifting of that warm air in a more stable air mass, that's going to produce more of the layer-like stratus clouds and more continuous precipitation from nimbo stratus clouds. So again, the stability of the atmosphere ahead of cold fronts is so very critical as to what type of weather we see here at the Earth's surface. If we have an unstable atmosphere where you typically have colder pockets of air, above warmer heated surface areas, that's going to result in cumulonimbus clouds, showers and thunderstorms, and if you have a more stable air mass ahead of a cold front, um, the air is not going to be lifted as vigorously in the vertical dimension, and that's going to produce more of a layer-like stratiform cloud, more continuous precipitation. All right, so we have to look at active fronts in two regards. We have to look at slow moving and fast moving active fronts. And the speed of a front itself is going to be dependent on the tilt of the trough in the middle levels of the atmosphere. But not only that, but it's going to be dependent upon the orientation of the mid level winds uh, in relation to the surface front. Um, so, for example, if as well as the jet stream. So, for example, uh, I'm going to skip down to the third bullet here and talk about the jet stream. 
If the jet stream is parallel to and above the cold side of the surface front, uh, generally if you have a parallel jet stream, parallel mid-level winds, the orientation of those mid-level winds, this is going to result in a slow moving active cold front. And as a result, you're going to have a large area of precipitation and clouds behind the surface cold front with cold air remaining fairly moist and humid behind the front because you have evaporation of precipitation as it falls from the cloud towards the ground through the colder surface layer. This is a slow moving active front. Um, the winds are generally more parallel to the surface front, so it's not going to push the front through very quickly. And positively tilted troughs, generally though that orientation is going to go from northeast to southwest when it's positively tilted. Okay. So everything pretty much, the mid and upper level winds are blowing parallel to the surface cold front when we're talking about a slow moving active front. As a result, you're going to have a lot of clouds and precipitation even behind the cold front. Here's an example uh, of a thickness chart on the left showing you surface frontal boundaries. Um, in general, the front has a steeper slope near the low center, near the center of the low pressure, a much shallower slope away from the low. And when we talk about fronts, we talk about steep versus shallow. And the bottom right hand portion of this graphic shows a steeper, a more steeply sloped front, and the very bottom right shows a more shallow slope front. Notice the orientation of that black solid line separating the warm and the cold air mass. When you have a cold front moving in, keep in mind that you are going to have warm air, a lot of cases warm air is going to be lifted because it's less dense, and the colder air is going to be more dense, it's going to, it's going to basically stay close to the ground. So a lot of cases you get cold over warm air when a cold front is pushing into an area. But the, the slope of the front is very important because with a steeper slope, more steeply sloped front, you're going to have more vigorous lifting in the vertical of the air mass, especially if the atmosphere is unstable as I, I've already mentioned. If you have a more shallow um, frontal surface, you have a more shallower slope, the air is, is going to rise um, less vigorously in the vertical. It's going gonna, it's gonna to rise, you're most likely going to get more of a stratiform cloud, uh, more layer-like cloud and more continuous precip, the more shallow that slope is. Here's an example of the placement of a cold front. You notice um, normally on a, on a chart this would be blue, but just for the sake of simplicity I'm showing you the general um, symbol for a cold front. In this case, it's represented by this solid black line with the triangles, okay? Um, the dashed lines, again, indicate your thickness values. And in general, you're going to have the placement of your surface front is going to be in the actual pressure trough where your isobars are kinking or bending and forming a U shape. And so you're gonna place that frontal boundary right there in the um, greatest bending or dipping of those isobars or lines of equal barometric pressure, the solid black lines. And you're also going to place your frontal surface along the leading edge of your tightest thickness packing. So you notice the dashed black lines here, how they get really close together and bunched up. The frontal boundary is placed out ahead along the leading edge of the tightest thickness packing, those dashed lines and how they're really tightly packed. Right, this particular image is showing you a graphic of how the slope, the, the depth of the cold air changes um, dependent on where you're located at in relation to the cold front. If you're back at points C and D, you're immediately right behind the cold front and the slope or the depth of that column of cold air is much shorter. The further back you get away from behind that cold front, the more uh, increase in depth you're going to have with the cold air. It's going to have an increasing cold air depth uh, further back at points A and B as compared to C and D in this image. Weather associated with an active cold front, uh, you're generally going to have clouds and precipitation at and behind the cold front itself. Now, I have seen two versions of cold fronts, and you may have also noticed this, <clears throat> but um, you have this type of cold front that blows through and the winds shift to the northwest and the air dries out rather quickly, high pressure builds in, and clouds break up, and you have a very nice day. This particular active cold front you're going to have lingering moisture behind the actual frontal passage. So you're going to have a more gradual clearing with an active cold front. 
the moisture and the clouds are going to linger longer behind the cold frontal surface. All right, and then we also have with fast moving active fronts. So we have slow moving and now fast moving. Now fast moving active fronts are often associated with a neutral or negatively tilted 500 millibar trough. Now negative tilts in a trough is one that's orientated more northwest to southeast. So we have a more of a perpendicular wind component of the mid upper level winds in this case. If you have a more perpendicular wind component or 90 degree orientation to the surface front, it's going to push that front through much quicker. And this is going to result in a faster moving active cold front. Now a steeper slope with only limited warm air advection overrunning above the frontal inversion occurs, but often significant warm air advection has already occurred ahead of the surface front. Um, thickness lines with a fast moving active front um, within the transition zone are more uniformly packed along the length of the front close to the jet stream this spread further apart equatorward of the jet stream. So let's take a look at some of this. With an active moving, a fast moving active front, the jet stream approaches and sometimes intersects the surface cold front position. Uh, you get a lot of strong lifting of air downstream of the trough axis or to the east of that trough axis. And you get a lot of active precipitation in clouds along or ahead of the surface front. So with a fast moving active front, your weather is typically out of along or ahead of the front itself. You get strong cold air advection or strong colder air moving in behind the front and subsidence, which is sinking air motion, which is going to produce more rapid clearing and drying behind the front in this case. Here's an example on a thickness chart of what a fast moving active cold front looks like. In this case, you have a more of a perpendicular wind component, the solid black lines, you see those solid black lines? Um, that orientation is oriented more perpendicular to the black solid line with the triangles, the cold front itself. And that's going to result in a quicker push, a quicker push of the frontal system to the east in this case. And one other thing to point out, see the dashed lines on this graphic, this thickness chart? Those show you those changes in the height or uh, changes in the thickness. The dashed lines are thickness lines. Uh, whenever you have the dark solid lines intersecting uh, these dashed thickness lines at a significant angle. That's going to indicate much colder temperatures, uh, more, much more effective temperature changes or advection in the atmosphere. This is an example of a fast moving active front. Notice points C and D in this case, the, um, the depth of the cold air is much shorter, especially at point C further south along the tail end of the cold front. Points A and B still show a fairly tall or vertical um, stretching of the cold air column, a greater vertical depth of the cold air column at points A and B further back. <clears throat> okay, this shows the jet stream orientation in relation to <clears throat> a cold front. So the dark solid line with the triangles, that's your cold surface cold front. And then the black arrow shows you the orientation of your jet stream lens. In this case, notice how that black arrow behind the cold front is more parallel to it. <clears throat> in this case, the strongest winds, the mid upper levels of the atmosphere are going to be blowing parallel to the surface cold front. In this case, this is going to indicate a slow moving active cold front. All right, so with passive fronts, this is another type of front, passive cold front, and these are associated with very little clouds and precipitation. Sometimes you get cold fronts to move through the area and all you see are some wispy clouds or maybe some mid-level alto cumulus clouds, but you really don't get much in the way of clouds or precipitation. Passive cold fronts are just that. They don't create a lot of weather. There's lack of jet stream. You don't have those jet stream maxes, those jet streams, um, stronger winds overhead. Um, so you really don't have a lot of synoptic scale lifting of the air mass. Um, here are some ways that fronts may become inactive or, or less active. Um, for example, a front may be located upstream to the west-northwest of the upper trough axis and it's residing within the upper level convergent area of the jet, jet max. In which case, you're going to have upper level convergence aloft is going to result in sinking air motion and subsidence. Right? The front may be associated with a shear lobe of vorticity signifying a lack of divergence within the jet streak. 
The environment immediately above or ahead of the front lacks any kind of warm air advection patterns. Uh, keep in mind when you have, typically out ahead of a cold front, you have southwesterly winds in the northern hemisphere, and this is going to result in warmer temperatures moving into an area out ahead of the cold front. And that warmer, less dense air typically wants to rise up and over the colder air, and that results in rising air motion, saturation, the development of clouds, and a lot of cases, precipitation. And so in this case, with the environment immediately above or ahead of the front, does not have a distinct warm air advection pattern, you're not really going to have a lot of lifting. Environment can be ahead of the front, may be stable, thus preventing sufficient lifting of clouds and precipitation formation. It also can be very dry ahead of the cold front, and this is going to inhibit clouds and precip. If you just don't have a lot of low-level moisture ahead of the cold front, you're just not going to get a lot of clouds, a lot of vertical lifting and moisture. Um, I've seen this happen before with passive fronts, especially when you get, consider, you have one major front move through, and then you get high pressure building behind it. You get sinking air motion with high pressure and typically draw a much drier air column, drier atmosphere. And then you get a secondary um, cold front that comes in rather quickly on the first cold front on its heels, and therefore you just don't get much in the way of uh, active weather with that secondary passive front. Now, passive fronts, just like with cold fronts, can be fast or slow moving, but they almost always are inactive. Inactive meaning they just don't have many clouds and precipitation. Um, in general, these are some of the characteristics of the passive fronts. Uh, very shallow slope above 900 millibars in the atmosphere. Um, so we're talking uh, generally between 2,500 feet and 5,000 feet above the ground. You have a very shallow slope. Um, therefore, you lack any kind of warm air vection overrunning where warm, moist air is riding up and over the colder air at the surface. The thickness lines may become widely spaced. The farther south you get along the front, this is going to indicate the shallow nature of the colder air. So these passive fronts typically occur with more weak cold fronts. Uh, you also have these passive fronts which are far removed from their parent upper level trough. And they're well south of the jet stream. So they just don't have many, much, much upper level dynamics to work with. Uh, generally they extend westward of the upper level trough in the upper level convergent pattern of the jet, jet stream maximum. Uh, passive fronts are generally void of clouds and precip. Not only is there an absence of jet supported divergence and lifting, so the main um, dynamics and the lifting remain well to the north of the front, but in general, the atmosphere on the warm side of the front is stable. Here's a great example of a satellite image. This is over southeastern Texas, between Houston, uh, Galveston area, down to Corpus Christi. Now, this is an example of a rope cloud. And a rope cloud is an elongated cloud in a satellite image, very thin in nature, as you can see. This rope cloud indicates a passive front. Now, I will mention this, that with cold fronts, you can have a much more active portion of the, of the cold front, further closer to the low pressure system, um, and also closer to the upper level dynamics. And the tail end of this front may become very passive. So you can have an active and a passive cold front at the same time. In this case, we're showing you the tail end of a cold front, the very end of the cold front moving into southeastern Texas. And this rope cloud is a dead giveaway. Meteorologists look for this rope cloud on satellite imagery to kind of tell what type of front we're dealing with. You do have some lower stratus up towards College Station, Austin, and San Antonio, which cooler and moist air behind the cold front situated up over those locations. This is a great satellite image to demonstrate a rope cloud and it's an indicator of a passive cold front. All right, so passive fronts are most commonly located within um, the most southward extensions of the polar front. So basically, the further south you get along the front, the cold front, the greater the likelihood of that front becoming passive. Um, and generally, as cold fronts move southward in the northern hemisphere, there's going to be a general decrease in thickness packing, which indicates your temperature um, Radiant is going to be much less. The air masses are modifying behind the cold front too. That cooler air behind the cold front is getting warmer as it moves closer toward the Gulf Coast and the Deep South a lot of times. That decreases or destroys your air mass contrast and therefore you get a weaker, more passive front. 
An increase in the distance between the surface front and the tightest thickness packing, another good indicator of a passive front. And again, like I just mentioned, you get a decrease in that thermal contrast or the air mass differences across the front are much less. And that results in um, colder air moving over an increasingly warmer surface. And that's going to basically cause a colder air to get warmer and that front is going to get weaker as a result. Now, Arctic cold fronts are a special type of front. And these occur mainly in the coldest months of the year, in the wintertime, uh, December, January, even into February. The Arctic cold front is a special kind of cold front. And many times it represents a reinforcement of extremely cold. When I mention CA, continental Arctic air, often following an early invasion of continental polar air, CP air. I did a video on the air masses. Please feel free to take a look at that on the YouTube channel. I kind of go into differences between continental Arctic CA air and continental polar CP air. With Arctic fronts, they may have either a shallow or steep slope at higher latitudes, but nearly always have a very shallow slope at lower latitudes. Um, steeper Arctic fronts normally are associated with a significant upper level trough or a shortwave trough at 500 millibars at 18,000 feet and an attendant jet streak. This jet streak is an area of increased winds within the jet stream. This is an example of an Arctic cold front. It's up over the northern portions of the United States. So we have a couple different fronts drawn on this particular um, weather chart. But the Arctic front is the one furthest north. There's an area of low pressure over southeastern South Dakota, and we have this Arctic front which is extending from it generally over um, northwestern Nebraska, northeastern Wyoming, into Montana. And there's a strong Arctic high, 1,045 millibar Arctic high, which is pushing in um, much colder Arctic air behind the Arctic cold front. Temperatures north of this front over the northern plains in this graphic are ranging from 16 to 10 degrees. I do see negative 15 across the border, across Montana into southern Canada. Just shows you that the solid lines are your isobars or lines of equal surface pressure. Um, with the Arctic front, you'll notice a much more tighter packing of those solid black lines behind the Arctic front, indicating how much more dense the air mass is. Here's another example of an Arctic front. In this case, we have very tight packing of the isotherms or lines of equal temperature, the dash lines, as well as tighter packing of the isobars, the solid black lines. Uh, in general, we have a very tight packing that's going to occur along the Arctic cold front. In this case, it's located um, from southeastern Canada into lower Michigan, across southern Wisconsin into southeastern Minnesota in this particular example. Um, I'm also showing uh, vorticity values in this case. Um, generally, you have uh, positive vorticity right ahead of the front, and then it will eventually become strongly negative behind it. And another example of an Arctic front uh, this case uh, showing you the Arctic front stretching uh, from the uh, New England states, uh, basically New Jersey down across the Ohio Valley into uh, down to Oklahoma. We have very strong thickness gradient or tighter thickness lines. Uh, those dash lines are packed much tightly closer together. Uh, we do have strong cold air advection on the front side of this Arctic high behind the Arctic front. And this is another great example of how the gradient is very tightly packed, whether we're talking the um, thickness gradient, whether we're talking the isobars, a very tightly packed spacing of these lines. Now, Arctic air will sometimes flow as what's known as a density current in directions dictated more by terrain than by jet stream forcing. Um, in general, the geography of the United States favors Arctic air masses to pour down from Canada um, generally east of the Rocky Mountains. The coldest, the, the greatest Arctic air, the strongest Arctic outbreaks typically occur um, based on that terrain, the north-south Rocky Mountains, and occur between the north-south Rocky Mountains as well as the north, uh, northeast and southwest oriented Appalachians. So between the Rockies and the Appalachians, you got flatter land, and so the coldest air, the Arctic air is going to be the strongest in locations between the Rockies and the Appalachians. You get shallow Arctic air, sometimes it frequently dams up against mountains, and that's known as cold air damming. Um, that's going to be shown by a tight isobar and thickness packing or gradient along the east side of the Rockies. Sometimes you see this in winter, you'll see this tight packing of these isobars or these thick 
thickness lines, uh, the, the cold Arctic air banks up against the eastern side of these mountains, uh, the Meraki Mountains in Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. Arctic air frequently will spread very far south through the plains and Mississippi River Basin, just like if you were to pour pancake syrup, uh, very thick uh, molasses, very thick um, fluid, and it's going to flow out along your plate. Pour that pancake syrup out over those pancakes and watch the dense liquid spread out, spread out over the pancakes and over the plate. And that's similar to what happens with Arctic air in the atmosphere. It flows like syrup or like water over relatively flat, gently sloping terrain. Here's another example of an Arctic cold front. In this case, uh, it's extending much further south, all the way down into central Texas. Um, you can see the tight packing of isobars, those black solid lines in this particular graphic, showing you um, very tight packing. Um, that's indicative of Arctic air, which is moving in behind the front. Uh, we have very cold temperatures in Kansas. Uh, Nebraska, 14 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 degrees in Nebraska. All the way down into Oklahoma, temperatures are now 34 degrees in Oklahoma City behind the Arctic front in this example. Northern Texas, 45 degrees. Um, so this is a case where the cold Arctic air is just flowing uh, like a density current. Very dense substance flowing down between the Rockies and the Appalachian Mountains, all the way down into the heart of Texas. <clears throat> so what are some of the characteristics of cold frontal passages? What would you be looking for um, if you have a home barometer, let's say, or if you have a weather station? What would you be looking for to notice if a cold front's moved through or not? First of all, whenever a front moves through an area, it's a frontal passage, it's known as, it's abbreviated FROPA, F-R-O-P-A. <clears throat> These are the eastern United States examples of FROPA, cold FROPA. Um, the wind is going to shift from a southerly to a northerly direction as the cold front moves through. You will see a sudden or sustained drop in temperatures and as well as the dew point, the moisture levels. You will see falling pressure ahead of the front, followed by abrupt and sustained rising air pressure during and after the frontal passage. And the clouds and precipitation are going to be highly variable. Um, in general, especially in the warmer months, you get more of a convective thunderstorm precipitation. Um, but sometimes in the winter months, you can get more of a stratiform, continuous, steady precipitation. <clears throat> but a lot of that precipitation, again, is going to be dependent on the stability of the air mass ahead of the front. Now what about warm fronts? We talked about cold fronts, now we also have to talk about warm fronts. And with a warm front, the warmer air mass is advancing and replacing the retreating cold air mass. And with the warm front, you have warmer, less dense air riding up and over colder air at the surface. The general structure, the horizontal of a warm front, you definitely have a temperature difference or discontinuity across the frontal surface. Um, the surface front and upper front are located on the warm side of the transition zone, generally located in a pressure or contour trough. Here's an example of a warm front. Now, you would normally see this as a red solid line with these semicircles. Um, in general, <clears throat> I'm showing you temperatures degrees Fahrenheit on this particular graphic. You'll notice how the temperatures change across the front. You have 50s, 52, 50 degrees, um, general low 50s north of the warm front, but south of the warm front in this example, over Tennessee, we got temperatures in the 70s. We have temperatures in the upper 70s and near 80 degrees across the deep south. And so when the warm front moves through, you're going to notice a wind shift. A wind shift is going to occur, and that's going to result in much warmer air advancing northward. On a thickness chart, this is exactly what a warm front would look like. It usually extends east-northeast out of a surface low pressure system. Um, generally, the thickness lines, you see where the placement of the warm front is, and again, it's along the leading edge of the tightest thickness packing. And so these dashed black lines represent your thickness lines. Um, generally, the more tightly packed thickness lines are, the colder the air mass. And so in this case, the warm front is placed along the leading edge of that pit thickness packing. Now there will be, as with all frontal passages, there will be a moisture difference across the frontal surface. Now, air behind or on the warm side of the warm front typically has a higher dew point, much more moisture. Uh, however, with a higher dew point, it doesn't necessarily equate to high humidity. You're still going to have lower relative humidity because 
um, your temperatures are much warmer as well. The dew point is going to increase with a warm frontal passage uh, farther from the saturation of the warm air because of the larger spread between temperature and dew point. So again, just because your dew point temperatures are increasing, making it feel a little more muggy out, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have higher relative humidity because your temperatures are also increasing as the warm front moves through. Air ahead on the cold side of the warm front normally is closer to saturation. So north of your surface warm front, the relative humidity is oftentimes near 100%, even though you have a lower dew point value. And this is mainly due to evaporation of moisture as that moisture falls out of the clouds north of the warm front and that cooler air from warm air aloft through the shallow cold layer, that evaporation is going to add moisture to the lower levels of the atmosphere. That evaporation is also going to increase the dew point temperature and it's going to produce very low clouds and a lot of times evaporation fog. So if you're north of a warm front, you typically see a low clouds, a low dull gray cloud mass, stratiform clouds. Here again is the example of the warm front and the temp, oh, this, in this case is dew point. So let's talk about dew point changes here. Um, I would place the warm front a little further north than what we're indicating here, but in general, you're going to have dew points increasing at, uh, south of the warm front. With pressure tendencies associated with the warm front, if you were looking at your home barometer, you would notice strong pressure falls right ahead of the surface warm front before it moved through. And then the pressure would behind that surface warm front may fall slowly or even rise slowly briefly and then remain steady. Here's an example of the pressure tendencies with a warm frontal passage. Um, generally, you are going to have lower pressure on the south side of the warm front and you have higher parametric pressure to the north. The wind directions and how these winds change across a warm front. Generally, north of a warm front, you're going to have more of an easterly or northeasterly wind. And then once the warm front passes through, you get more of a southeasterly wind. So a lot of cases, you go from a northeast to a southeast wind. If you were to pay attention to your home weather station or look at the National Weather Service website, the latest observations they post, you would notice a east-northeast wind becoming southeasterly. That would be an indicator of the warm front moving through your area. And in the vertical, if we were to go higher aloft in the vertical, a warm frontal surface is going to slope over the colder air mass closer to the ground. Again, this has to do with density differences of the air mass. Um, generally, warmer air associated with warm fronts, um, we call an overrunning situation where that warm, moist air rides up and over, being less dense, rides up and over the colder surface air. And this results in a definite cloud sequence, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, generally, if you go above 5,000 feet above the ground, a well-defined frontal trough, you cannot find it anymore. Uh, it really won't be there. Um, but strong fronts with steeper slopes may be clearly defined up through 18,000 feet or 500 millibars. But weak fronts with shallow slopes are normally best defined at, at 5,000 feet and below in the atmosphere. Right here again is a warm front extending out of a surface low. Now, the warm front is indicated by those semicircle lines, okay, or the semicircles along this line. Showing you what thickness chart would look like with a, uh, actually it's the 850 millibar chart. Uh, generally showing you what it would look like. 700 millibar chart. We're starting to have a hard time at 700 millibars picking up the warm front. Um, so, in this case, it's really getting hard to define up at 700 millibars or 10,000 feet. This shows the stacking of upper warm fronts. Um, generally, fronts are going to stack back towards the northwest as you get higher up in the atmosphere. Um, so the bottom right composite really really shows it well. Um, you get a, the, the solid dark line with the semicircles is your surface warm front position. And as you progressively go up in the atmosphere to 850 millibars or 5,000 feet, all the way up to 500 millibars, 18,000 feet, you notice how the stacking works its way back towards the northwest. <clears throat> Generally, winds are going to veer with height through um, when you have warm air moving in. Uh, generally, what I mean by veering is the winds are going to change direction from the surface um, through the upper levels, uh, lower and upper levels of the atmosphere. The winds are going to veer or turn clockwise with height. <clears throat> 
And generally with warm front characteristics, their movement is slower than a cold front. They're influenced strongly by the speed that the colder air mass retreats. So I want you to think of cold air as being stubborn, it's heavy, it's dense. Uh, if you ever try to go push a really heavy car, it's going to be much more difficult than, let's say, a lighter, smaller car, right? If you throw it in neutral, you'll be able to push a, a smaller car much more effectively compared to a heavier car. Um, same thing with warm fronts. Warm air is trying to move into an area occupied by colder air, but that colder air sometimes is really heavy and dense and stubborn. It doesn't want to move out of the way. In this case, you have lower troposphere warm air advection, warm air moving in. Um, that's going to have a large influence on the movement of the warm front and the strength of the upward vertical motion of rising air via overrunning. Sometimes you'll hear the National Weather Service use a fancy term in their discussions called isentropic upglide or isentropic uplift. And what they're referring to is warmer air moving in over a colder surface, over a colder air mass, and you get that gradual upgliding motion of the warm moist air over the colder surface. <clears throat> now, as far as the movement, as far as the movement and lifting of the warm air, as the warm air is lifted, it's going to undergo a case of what's known as adiabatic cooling. Anytime air rises in the atmosphere, it's going to cool, the pressure is going to lessen. Um, as that air cools, it's eventually going to, uh, temperature will reach the dew point. And that's going to result in saturation of clouds. But in this case, when warm air is lifted, it undergoes the adiabatic cooling. Now, as the adiabatic cooling occurs, it's going to offset the effects of the warmer air. All right. Um, in a simplistic view, if all that warm air vection, the warm air moving in, goes into horizontal movement of warm air from one location to another, no vertical motion is going to occur, but the warm front is going to move quickly. So we're talking about more of a, uh, an inactive warm frontal passage in, in this case, if all the warm air vection goes into horizontal movement of warm air. Now, if all the warm air vection goes into vertical motion of warm air upward in the vertical, uh, you won't have any horizontal temperature increase and the front will not move. So in general, let me just break down the rules of thumb for warm fronts. If the warm front is moving quickly, you'll get little lift along the front. And you, most of the time, you're going to get little or no precipitation. However, if the warm front is moving slowly, you get more significant overrunning with the warm air moving up and over the cooler surface, and you're going to get more widespread precipitation as a result. And keep in mind that whenever you have warmer air moving into an area, warm advection, that's going to promote surface pressure falls because warm air is less dense. Therefore, your barometric pressure needle is going to fall or get lower. And that's going to aid in the progression of the low pressure system. And then we talk about vertical structure active warm fronts. And in many ways, they're slim, similar to slow moving active cold fronts. Um, in both cases have significant warm air vection overrunning, warm air moving up and over colder air. Both have expansive clouds, saturation and precipitation on the cold side of the front. Uh, however, they differ mainly in the direction in which they move. Cold fronts are generally going to advance towards the warmer air, while warm fronts advance towards colder air. And as with cold fronts, warm front lifting is greatly affected by the presence and dynamics of the jet stream and where that upper level divergence or removal of mass sets up, as well as stability and moisture content of the warmer air mass itself. Topographical effects such as mountains also are important. Whenever you have frontal systems moving towards mountain ranges, um, the air cannot pass through the mountain range, physically impossible, so there's a great modification to the upper front and its, and its positioning, as well as the sensible weather um, when we're talking about fronts interacting with orographics or topography mountain ranges. The classic warm front cloud sequence, now you can follow this by just simply watching the sky yourself. Um, but generally you have cirrus clouds will be the first sign of a warm front approaching. Those cirrus clouds eventually lower to cirro stratus, then to mid-level alto stratus, nimbo stratus, and then stratus and fog closer to where the front intersects the ground. This is a great sequence of warm frontal clouds. Again, your first sign of a warm front approaching your area may just be those wispy ice crystal cirrus clouds, but as you get lower and closer to where the warm front intersects the surface or the ground, you will see a gradual lowering of your clouds from high cirrus and cirrostratus 
all the way down to nimbostratus and stratus clouds. And the precipitation type is going really to depend on the time of the year and the vertical temperature profile on the cold side of the warm front. Uh, generally, if the temperature of that cold air mass uh, north of the warm front is below freezing and air is below freezing throughout the entire atmospheric column, you're going to have snow falling well in advance of the warm front. All right, and I've seen this growing up in the Midwest. This is really interesting. This is a case, I've seen it where a warm front approaches the area and it'll start off as snow. But as that warm air, the warm front gets closer and the warm air, um, the greater than 30 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Fahrenheit, the vertical air column gets warmer and warmer and thicker, that area of greater than 32 degrees Fahrenheit freezing, the snow will eventually transition over to a mix of rain and snow. And then if you get enough of a strong enough warm front to move in, it may eventually turn to a cold rain. I've seen that happen in the winter quite a bit. Now you get what's known as the elevated warm layer above the frontal inversion. And the elevated warm layer is that area in the upper atmosphere, the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere where the temperature is above freezing. And that causes a melting of the snowflakes. Here's warm frontal precipitation. This is a great graphic that shows you pretty far distance out in the horizontal away from the warm front your air may be cold and maybe below freezing. In that case, you're going to get all snow. But as you get closer to the warm frontal surface intersecting with the ground, the depth of the warm layer is getting thicker and thicker. And in that case, the snowflakes eventually will melt. It might mix in with some sleet. Perhaps they mix in with some, you know, you have a case of some freezing rain temporarily. Um, and then that's going to eventually change over to rain, possibly drizzle and fog closer to the intersection of the warm front with the ground. And so you can have a sequence of crazy, crazy weather. I have driven a distance um, from Norfolk down to Virginia Beach. I've seen this firsthand. I have driven in heavy snow at Norfolk, uh, and then just maybe five miles down the road, I'm in a cold rain. I literally have driven through a situation like this. So you can get a wide range of precipitation types in the wintertime when you have warm fronts moving in. And with warm fronts, you typically get rain, more of a steady light rain and or drizzle, which occurs near the front where the surface air is above freezing. And you, know, you get a lot of fog because the air is so saturated closer to the warm frontal uh, intersection with the ground. If the warmer air is dry or upper vertical motion is weak, you may only get these high wispy cirrus clouds and that might be it. So you do get some warm fronts that are inactive with no real weather due to lack of moisture, air mass stability, and or lack of lift. Um, so that is possible. Here's warm from a precipitation again, just showing you uh, again how that warm air, the elevated warm layer, the area where the temperatures are greater than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, once that thickens, your, your precipitation becomes more liquid. Uh, and one of the biggest downfalls with warm frontal weather is you get a lot of stratus, a lot of low stratus clouds, especially in winter time. Um, and this, you know, you get a lot of fog near that, that, that intersection of the warm front with the surface. And so there could be a lot of airport delays is what I'm getting at, especially in the month of December. I've seen uh, this, this warm air advection and the warm fronts really hamper flight operations quite a bit in the month of December, where you have uh, shortest daylight hours, and you just get this warm air riding up over the cooler surface, the land surface, resulting in a lot of saturation and, and just reduced visibilities and fog and drizzle that can last quite a bit. Transition to precipitation. This is a surface analysis chart showing an area of low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the warm front is pretty far to the south over um, southeastern Florida. Uh, north of the warm front, temperatures are fairly cool. If you look along the Gulf Coast, you actually had an Arctic air mass to the north of this developing low pressure system. Temperatures at Mobile, Alabama, and this particular example are down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Pensacola, 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so you're getting more of a lighter rain and drizzle closer to the warm front. But the further north you go, the colder the temperatures get. And in this case, you have snow falling in um, Montgomery, Alabama, um, in parts of Georgia. Uh, so this just goes to show you how 
the precipitation can transition in association with uh, warm fronts. And then finally, let's talk about occluded fronts. Um, in this case, when you have an occluded front, um, you have colder air, a colder front, colder air is much more denser and wants to move much more quickly. And eventually what happens over time is the cold front catches up to the warm front. And once that happens, warm air is completely lifted off the ground into the upper atmosphere, where you have warmer air residing aloft over the colder surface air. Uh, Occluded fronts are typically associated with very strong low pressure systems. Um, there's two types of occlusions as well. We talk about cold and warm type occlusions. Uh, but a lot of cases, research suggests that there's something that's known as instant occlusions, which represent a third type of occluded front. So let's take a look at an occluded front. Let's take a look at first a cold type occlusion. And with a cold type occlusion, you have the coldest air found behind the occlusion itself. And it's normally located within what's known as a thermal ridge or higher thickness uh, on a thickness lines on a thickness chart. It appears as an extension of a cold front moving southward um, of the warm front position. In this case, cold, the cold air is going to overtake the warm front. It lifts the warm air completely off the ground above the warm front and lifts cool air residing beneath the warm front. Here's an example of a cold type occlusion. Upper left hand graphic shows what it looks like. So an occluded front basically is a solid line which has a semicircle and a triangle on the same side of that solid line. In this case, it's a cold type of occlusion. So we have the coldest air behind the occluded front. Cooler air is north of the warm front and the warmer air is south of the warm front and ahead of the cold front. Bottom right image shows a thickness chart and notice how the cold occlusion is in the what's known as the thickness ridge, uh, generally where the thickness lines bow back towards the northwest, back towards the surface low. Here's an example of a cold occlusion over the east coast of North America. This is associated with an explosive uh, cyclone. In this case, this was a bomb cyclone um, situated off into the Gulf of Maine, producing a very, very significant snowstorm across Maine and New England. Um, and you typically could get more cold occlusions over the eastern U.S. because in the wintertime you get this extremely cold continental polar air moving from the land towards the water. So the coldest air is going to be behind these occluded fronts. Um, so there's, there's very strong winds associated with this occlusion in this particular case back in January of 2002. Here's some of the three-dimensional aspects of a um, cold air occlusion. Uh, notice that you're getting a wide variety of cloud types uh, ranging from cirrus to alto stratus to alto cumulus. In the cooler saturated air you have lower strato cumulus, um, nimbo stratus right there along the occluded front itself. But in general, look at the horizontal distance in miles that this thing can cover. Um, so it's, it's quite a significant horizontal coverage or, or distance that this is impacting. So cold air occlusions are quite common over the eastern portions of continents, uh, the western oceans in the wintertime. They may be found along the west coast of continents in summertime. And that's mainly due to the fact that in the summertime, the land is heating up much more quickly. And the cooler waters of the North Pacific um, are going to allow cooler air to form behind these cold type occlusions in the summer. Another type of occlusion is what's known as a warm type occlusion. And this is where you have the coldest air found ahead of the occluded front, uh, normally located behind that thermal ridge on thickness charts. The warm type occlusion appears as an extension of a warm front, poleward of surface cold front, and the warm type of occlusion forms where cold front and cool air behind it are forced aloft over the warm frontal surface. Here's an example graphically of a warm type occlusion showing the coldest air out ahead of the occluded front in this case. There is some cooler air behind the occluded front, but it's not as cold as the air ahead of the occluded front. Uh, the image on the right shows now that the occluded front is an extension of the warm front, and it's behind, behind the thickness ridge now. Here's an example of a warm type of occlusion. Um, in this particular weather chart, we're showing you a position off the Pacific Northwest, off the west coast of Canada. Uh, in this case, the land mass is colder than the uh, waters of the Northeast Pacific. So you have 
the coldest air ahead of the occluded front um, out over the land mass. And you have a modifying cool air mass behind the occluded due to the water. In the three dimensions, this is what the type of clouds you'd expect with a, a warm type of occlusion. Um, just depending on the stability of the warm air, that's going to dictate whether you have more of a nimbostratus clouds and continuous preset or cumulonimbus clouds, unstable air, where you get more of a showering nature to the precipitation, possible pop-up thunderstorms. Again, a wide variety of clouds in association with a warm type of occlusion in this case. And so warm type of occlusions are common over western portions of continents, eastern oceans in the winter. It may be found along the east coast of continents and western oceans in summer. And then finally, we'll talk about instant occlusions. And this is the formation of an occluded front, usually from a surface trough embedded in colder air. Uh, these instant occlusions form as a shortwave disturbance in the mid-levels of the atmosphere progresses over an expansive region of cold, stable air. That short wave aloft is going to force a surface trough and low pressure center to form in the colder air mass. This is going to transition shortly thereafter into an occluded front. And with an instant occlusion, what's interesting about it is there's no merger of the warm and the cold fronts. There's somewhat warmer air aloft that's lifted by the jet stream, which is associated with the jet, the short wave and a positive vorticity, and you're gonna get clouds and precipitation to develop. Here's an example of an instant occlusion on a weather chart. Again, there's no merger of the warm and cold fronts in this case. Um, it's really a dynamic situation in which you get a mid-level shortwave trough that moves over an existing cold air mass, which destabilizes the atmosphere up through the surface of the mid-levels. And you get this low pressure center that forms and you have just one occlusion. Another example of an occlusion instant occlusion. Often instant occlusions form when a surface trough and a low pressure system deeply embedded in cold stable air approach a baroclinic frontal zone and as the low moves poleward of this baroclinic zone the trough trailing south from the low intersects a surface front. This is what's known forms as what's known as a triple point. Now, that triple point is really important. Um, that's usually the location if you get the right dynamics, the right upper level dynamics, the triple point could very well, number one, it's the point in which you have typically the most severe weather with an occluded front, but also it could be a point in which a new area of low pressure forms along. So characteristics of classic occluded fronts. If you have an occluded front coming in your area, what type of weather can you expect? Well, dependent on whether you're dealing with a warm or a cold type of occlusion, the temperature structure will vary. Uh, the winds are going to veer or change in a clockwise manner with passage. Uh, winds ahead of the occlusion are typically east or southeast, and then they're going to veer west or southwest behind the occlusion. And occluded fronts are found in or near low pressure troughs within thickness ridging. And again, the structure can vary greatly. Uh, vertical motion, the air rising, the latent heat release, and other diabatic effects as well as terrain those all can substantially affect the thermal pattern associated with the occlusion, the temperature patterns. The jet relationships, when we talk about occlusions, uh, we have two types of occlusions when we talk about the jet relationship in relation to frontal systems and low pressure. Uh, one of two configuration occurs, and this is uh, basically a type A or type B occlusion. With a type A occlusion, uh, you get more of a meridional trough cyclogenesis. Cyclogenesis is a fancy way to say uh, the development of a low pressure area or an intensification of an existing low. Uh, meridional pattern is when you have the jet stream doing some, taking some great dips, a lot of up and down wavy motion. Um, type A occlusions occur along the east coast of the U.S. and the western Atlantic. Uh, they begin formation at the surface and the primary driver of type A occlusions is low level thermal or temperature changes, evection. The jet, is, jet stream is going to cross the occlusion as a well-defined band of strong winds. The jet axis is going to remain, remain uniform, and the jet axis is going to cross the occlusion at or just north of a triple point when over water. Triple point is located at the intersection of all three fronts. Um, you'll find the triple point um, at the intersection of the warm, cold, and occluded front. 
keep in mind, there's different dynamics when we talk about um, these occlusions over water versus over land. Um, over land, you get greater frictional effects, and you also have varying degrees of terrain. You might have higher mountainous terrain. You may have large stability of the polar air masses over land as compared to over water. And that's going to play a big role in the position of the frontal systems themselves. Here's an example of a type A occlusion on a, I got a 500 millibar chart on the left and a 300 millibar chart on the right. The 500 millibar chart on the left is associated with um, 18,000 feet in the atmosphere where we typically see a lot of mid-level disturbances. And the 300 millibar chart is the jet stream level where we see generally up, up around uh, 30,000 feet. Uh, in general, with this type of occlusion, uh, image on the right shows uh, where the jet stream crosses over um, in relation to the low pressure system. Keep in mind, with type A, the jet axis crosses the occlusion at or just north of the triple point where all three fronts meet. And that's what we're showing you here on the right. And there's a better depiction. The triple point is going to be the point where the warm, the cold, and the occluded front meet. And you notice this the thinner black arrow line? That shows you where the jet stream is crossing. Right, where that jet axis crosses over the frontal boundaries, just to the north of the triple point. Satellite indications of a type A occlusion, you'll get what's known as baroclinic zone cirrus. Um, Vorticity comma clouds are visible, where you see that big swirl of cloud, the whole cloud, mass of clouds. And then you get deformation zone cirrus northwest of the surface low. And here it is depicted um, generally where you're going to have the occlusion. Now, one tricky thing with occlusions I will mention, these can be big time forecast busters. Um, you might be predicting an area of heavy snow, for example, in the wintertime with a occluded system, um, but you get a strong push of dry air in association with the dry conveyor belt, which we talked about in the last training, and that may result in uh, no precipitation at all for a location that was forecasted to get a significant snowstorm. So when you're involving occlusions, you're talking about punches of drier air, um, and you can see this clearly on a water vapor image, um, but in general, um, with that dry conveyor belt getting wrapped into the circulation of the low uh, with an occluded front, things can get really tricky as far as uh, forecasts go. And then finally, to end the training, I'm going to talk about type B occlusions. Uh, these are going to form a response to massive divergence from the southern and northern branches of the jet stream. In some cases, you get both the, the, the jet streams max, the jet stream maximum, or jet streaks, which are high speed ribbons of air embedded within the jet stream. Sometimes they overlay each other. The subtropical and the polar front jet streams uh, overlay each other, and that results in accelerator, accelerated rising air motion, especially if you get an upper level divergent quadrant of one jet overlying the upper level divergent quadrant of a secondary jet. Uh, this divergence is indicated by definitely the differential vorticity infection, um, changes in vorticity values, positive vorticity being associated with rising air motion, negative vorticity infection with sinking air motion. <coughs> and then you get what's known as a negatively tilted trough. A negatively tilted trough is associated with type B occlusions. These are much more intense systems, especially for East Coast winter storms up along the U.S. East Coast. <clears throat> They're a product of split flow. Uh, this is a case where you have one jet stream moving north and some tropical jet stream moving south and then they meet uh, generally along the east coast of the U.S. or also uh, along the central U.S. or east of the Rockies is another common area. <clears throat> Their formation begins in the mid-levels. The jet, does not, jet stream does not cross the occlusion intact. You get a lot of latent heat releasing. Latent meaning hidden heat released within the overrunning precipitation. And that's going to result in further instability um, beneath the jet stream. Latent heat release in the baroclinic low. You get strongest uh, baroclinicity shifting poleward. Um, and the jet is going to wrap in towards the upper level low and then form a new segment farther poleward. So in a type B configuration occlus occlusions, type B occlusion configuration, you have one branch of the jet stream wrapping into the low, and then it splits and breaks off with another branch uh, over the top. And I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute. Um, trough is definitely negatively tilted in this case, and you have a well-defined closed upper low forming within the trough. Here it is. 
Um, so the orangish colors are indicative of where latent heat release is occurring. Uh, and this is eventually going to cause a shift in the jet stream to the north, where that dash line is. See where the dash lines are? Those dash line arrows indicate the final position of the jet stream. Uh, the black solid line indicates the initial position of the jet stream. So it breaks off into two distinct pieces. Late heat release has a big role um, in, in where things eventually end up. Here's another example of a type B occlusion. Notice that the black arrows wrap in, stay back in the colder air, and wrap in towards the surface slow, the black L, and then there's another branch over the top north of the warm front. There's another arrow there um, north of that. Here's a type B configuration. Uh, if I were to show you a 300 millibar chart on the right, you notice those solid dark arrows and how they wrap inward towards the low pressure center, but then they break off and split with the top of that right hand, uh, the right hand graphic there showing the dark um, jet stream finger up there. Okay, and this is just showing you some more examples. And then finally, um, I do have to mention one more front before we close the training, and that's a stationary front. And it's exactly what that is. A stationary is a front which, which exhibits little or no movement. Uh, you do have temperature differences across the front, as with all frontal surfaces. Um, generally, you have a surface front on the warm side of the transition zone. The front will align a frontal trough like all other fronts. And in this case, with a stationary front, the winds are pretty much blowing parallel to the front. Thus, you get very little push of the front, very little movement. Uh, temperature discontinuity across the stationary front, you have a cooler air to the north of the frontal boundary and warmer air to the south. Uh, generally, on a thickness chart, this is what it would look like. The tightest thickness packing remains to the north of the stationary front in the cooler air mass. The pressure field around the stationary front, the pressure will be lowest right along the frontal boundary itself. It will be higher, usually you get a high pressure system to the north of the front, so the pressure rises as you go north of the front in the cooler air. And the pressure will once again rise slightly south of the, of the stationary front um, and then eventually start falling in the warmer air mass. The wind field around a stationary front, basically the winds are blowing parallel and opposite direction to each other across the stationary front. We usually have east and northeast winds north of the stationary boundary and uh, westerly winds south of the boundary. And here's an example of a stationary front. The dark solid line with the triangles um, eventually becomes stationary on the tail end over, um, tail end of the front over Montana into the Dakotas. Generally showing you the position of thickness lines where the thickness packing, the dash lines are tightly packed in the cooler air north of the stationary front. And stationary fronts can be either active where they have precipitation or passive where there's really no precipitation. Uh, this is all going to be dependent on the upper level dynamics, uh, the jet stream position. Active stationary fronts often have weather similar to warm fronts due to strengthening warm air advection overrunning ahead of the approaching shortwave trough or that mid-level disturbance at 18,000 feet. Uh, many times, stationary fronts are about to become warm fronts. And then with passive stationary fronts, lift tends to be concentrated near the surface front itself. We just don't have much in the way of vertical lifting. Um, we're, we're lacking any significant shortwave disturbances and removal of mass aloft and divergence. The temperature advection patterns are um, less, the gradient is much weaker with a passive stationary front. Here's an example of a stationary front at the surface. In this case, uh, we're probably looking at winter time here. I don't have a date on this weather chart, but generally the frontal boundary extends from central Florida all the way across the northern Gulf of Mexico. Cooler air situated to the north with a high pressure system over northern Mississippi and western Tennessee. Um, and the warmer temperatures are going to be south of that stationary front. And the upper level winds, actually the mid-level winds at 500 millibars, 18,000 feet, are generally blowing parallel. They're generally from the west-southwest in this example, which is paralleling the surface front, which is going to result in very little movement of the front. <clears throat> generally, what you get with stationary fronts is very stagnant weather, uh, where you get a lot of clouds, and in a lot of cases, you get light precipitation. It's fairly continuous 
<clears throat> and, and, and get a lot of low cloud ceilings or cloud bases, which can have a major impact on the airport operations. Now, obviously, if the air mass is stable, you're getting more of a layered stratiform cloud and more continuous light precipitation, perhaps drizzle around a stationary front. Um, if you are associating the stationary front with an unstable air mass, you get more of the puffier cumulus clouds, more vertical rising air motion, and more showery precipitation. You can even get thunderstorms uh, in some cases. In this uh, particular example, I'm just showing you, I uh, have some rain showers, even some thunderstorms uh, to the north of the stationary front in this example, that solid black line. Notice stationary fronts have a solid black, they have a, usually be a red and blue line. Um, but in this case, they have uh, triangles pointing one way and then semicircles on the other side of the uh, line. So stability of the warmer air mass is going to determine what type of clouds form. Um, generally, meteorologists are going to use the skew-t log-p diagram, a vertical sound into the atmosphere, to really see what how things are changing with height above the ground. And that wraps it up. All right, I try to keep this as simple and short as possible, but fronts are a very important process in the atmosphere. We definitely need to pay attention to the location of fronts, um, whether it be a cold front, fast or slow moving, passive or active, inactive, whatever the case, warm fronts, stationary fronts and occluded fronts, all these fronts produce some sort of lifting mechanism. A frontal boundary is simply an area of lower atmospheric pressure um, and you usually will get some sort of lifting of air along frontal boundaries. Uh, and, and frontal boundaries play a huge role in the weather across the mid-Atlantic and southeast Virginia in the wintertime. Um, stronger cold fronts can really usher in some very cold, cold continental polar air behind them. Um, in some cases, you get a warm front that moves northward along the east coast which has a significant role in determining the type of precipitation you get in the wintertime as well. So fronts are very, very important. You see them on the evening weather maps. If you're watching the Weather Channel or watching the, your TV news, local TV news, you will see the weatherman, meteorologist, he'll talk about, he or she will talk about where those fronts are located. Um, so again, very important. Temperature and moisture is going to change significantly across these fronts uh, from warm to cold, cold to warm. Uh, very moist or very dry and, and again fronts are the boundaries along air masses they, they're the battle areas where air masses meet and converge uh, so very very important all right that wraps things up spot on weather if you like what you see continue to follow us here on the spot on weather youtube channel appreciate everybody's attention today to the training i hope everybody has a great day take care everybody until next time Spot on weather. If we're not spot on, we're not doing it right. Take care.